Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. Messiah come. The Christ is resuscitated. Christos den Estual. Christos den Siu. Christos vos crece. Today is called the Sunday of the paralytic. It's named after the gospel lesson that we heard from the fifth chapter of the Gospel of St. John, where the Lord heals a man who had been paralyzed for 38 years, 38 long years. This man had been lying by the pool of Bethesda near the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem. As you heard, what was special about this pool is that at certain seasons, an angel of the Lord came down into the pool, troubled the water, and the first person to step into the pool was healed. In church language, we say that the pool is a type. It is imperfect because it points to something perfect that is yet to come. In the pool, not everyone was healed and not all the time. Only the first one to go in after the troubling of the water. The pool was a type that is fulfilled in the mystery of holy baptism. This is the mystery that perfectly heals everyone who is immersed into the water as they are immersed into Christ's death and they rise in his resurrection. Now, as is often the case in a lot of passages of scripture, there is a lifetime of sermons in this passage and I wouldn't do much justice to everything if I try to cover everything, but there is something about the 38 years, that's a significant number, that's a sermon on its own. There is the whole thing about the healing on the Sabbath, that's another sermon on its own. The five porticos associated with the pool, that's also another sermon. There's actually a number of things to to encourage you, a number of reasons to encourage you to read the entirety of chapter 5 when you go home. Chapter 5 of the Gospel of John. There are many things that are very relevant to many of the discussions that I hear from you. The things that sometimes people trouble you with, whether it is the divinity of Christ or the Holy Trinity or the whole Calvinist uh, approach to salvation by grace only or by faith only. Uh, there's a lot in there that unpacks a lot of this. Uh, chapter 5 of St. John's Gospel. And of course, if you move on to chapter 6, there the divinity of Christ is absolutely unquestionable. But that's about as much as I'll, I'll just lay those at your feet and then you could uh, explore these. But I want to get back to the pool and the healing that happened at the pool of Bethesda. The pool was both a place of great miraculous healings and a place of profound misery. St. John records that this place was filled with miserable people, invalids, blind, lame, and the paralyzed. While there were many that had been healed through the troubling of the water, there were many, many more that were not and had to struggle with the profound misery of their condition. The Lord coming to the pool of Bethesda is, of course, a historical event, and we do not deny that at all, but it is also a type of his coming into the world to heal 
the brokenness of humanity. We see this brokenness at the pool not only in the miserable condition of those who are ill, but we also see it playing out in the dynamic that is there. Each person likely had somebody from his close circle, from his family or his friends. And as soon as the water would be troubled, that person would help them to get into the water to beat everybody else and to get the healing. Each one cared only for their own. And this is the situation that has left this paralytic in his misery for 38 years. Every time he tried to drag himself into the water, someone else gets in before him. What a miserable image. It's not just miserable because it happened to this man. It is miserable because we continue to behave this way today, don't we? Don't we often reserve our help to our family members and our close friends? Why do we fail to see how much we contribute to this brokenness in the world? As long as we behave in this way, our world will continue to be broken. And this alone should show us how incapable we are of healing ourselves. And it should throw us at the mercy of the incarnate Word and Son of God who came to heal the brokenness of the world and to give us new life. Now, although Christ is the only one who can heal, we still have a role to play. Just look at how he approaches this paralytic. The Lord knows this man's condition. He knows how long he has been suffering, and it's likely because he has been suffering the longest or the most that he chose to come to him. He knows all of this, yet he asks him, do you want to be healed? At the face of it, we may think, what kind of a question is this? But it's so important that we pay attention to this exchange between the Lord and the paralytic. Because that's a question that you and I need to answer. Do you want to be healed? Everyone who hopes to be delivered from illness needs to be answering the question, do you want to be healed? When we are struggling with whatever illness it is, whether it's physical pain, psychological stress, or spiritual illness, the Lord is asking us, do you want to be healed? When we struggle with anger, impatience, resentment, persistent complaining, that's another one that comes out a lot, or a judgmental attitude toward others, the Lord asks us, do you want to be healed? If you are overtaken with lustful desires or struggle with substance abuse, the Lord is asking, do you want to be healed? And if like this paralytic, you have been struggling alone for a long time, and the only answer that you have is, sir, I have no man to put me in the pool. I have no man to help me. I have no man to turn to. I have no man to drag me into the pool of repentance. The Lord says to you, what do you mean you have no man? For your sake, I became the man. The man who came seeking you lying by the pool. I know your condition and I see your pain. For your sake, 
I came to heal you. You don't need any other man. Rise, take up your pallet, and walk. St. John records that as soon as the Lord told the paralytic, Rise, take up your pallet, and walk, immediately the man was healed and took up his pallet and walked. We might miss this because it's just one verse after another. When we read the text, we miss this, but the fathers of the church point out something important here. It is true that the Lord did not require faith to heal this man, but the very fact that the man heard the Lord's command and even tried to stand up shows that he has faith. Or at least that his faith had been strengthened by his encounter with the Lord. Consider this for a moment. Here's a man who's been paralyzed and miserable for 38 years. He hears Christ asking him, do you want to be healed? He doesn't respond in anger. He doesn't lose his patience. He doesn't say to the Lord, what kind of question is this? Are you mocking me? He doesn't say any of this. That's the way most of us would react. Most of us wouldn't last 38 hours, let alone 38 years. Probably being generous, most of us wouldn't last 38 minutes. If you don't believe me, watch how we behave when we have to spend a few hours in an emergency room. I'm not trying to defend our sadly broken healthcare system. And in fact, if we look a little bit ahead, it seems as if 38-hour wait times may not be too far. But maybe we can learn to put our hope in the one who sees our pain and understands our misery in this broken world. The one who saw the paralytic and sees us. Maybe we can learn from the faith of the paralytic who simply didn't complain, but simply poured out his heart to the Lord. That's prayer. And when the Lord tells him to rise, he does not question and he doesn't offer excuse after excuse as to why he cannot rise. He just obeys. With faith, he rises, picks up his pallet, and he walks, not concerned about whether it's the Sabbath or not. That's real faith that makes the paralytic a co-participant in his healing. And he maintains this faith not only as he was healed and no one was challenging him, but he maintains the faith when the religious professionals corner him and question him. Why are you carrying your bed on the Sabbath? There is so much to unpack in that exchange. And of course, that's the same faith that we see in another precious moment at the very end of the gospel when Jesus found the paralytic in the temple. That's where faith takes you after healing. So no matter what our illness, physical, psychological, or spiritual, Christ wants to make us co-participant in the healing he offers us. That's how unimposing he is. He offers and waits for us. Compared to his work, our work is infinitely small, but not insignificant. We can't take away the sin of the world. We can't ascend the cross or overthrow Hades or trample down death or give new life. That's Christ's work. But our work is to gratefully accept this new life with joy as we enter into his life every day. Every day we enter into his life by denying ourselves, picking up the cross, and following him.
to paraphrase St. Paul, it is when we are united with him in a death like his that we will be united with him in a resurrection like his. Christ is risen.